to. It's entirely optional. Welcome to today's Bloomington Rotary Club weekly celebration of service. It's April 26th, 2022. How did that happen? I'm your current president, Sally Gaskill. I want to remind everyone of the vision of our club, which is to be a diverse, engaged community of leaders whose fellowship and service have a significant impact locally and globally. We are a part of 1.4 million Rotarians and Rotaractors throughout the world. Um, I would like to ask Charlotte Zitlow if she might like to give the reflection today. And here comes the mic. Y'all can be seated. Thank you. It's not on. Okay. One of my favorite things about Rotary is its international program, and its program is for, for young people. And we have a two scholarship programs that we support in this in this with this club. One of them is the overseas global scholarships, and the other one is scholarships for for people in our local high schools. Well, I've been uh, serving on the committee for the local high school scholarship for several years. And I think and every year I'm, I'm and every year I'm reminded why, because it's so much fun and so 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 encouraging to meet the young people who apply for these this scholarship, who are bright and 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 doing very well in high school, and they have all sorts of interests, and they're, they're people, young people who are thinking a lot. So it's it's very encouraging when when the world seems sort of going the wrong way. I, I love being with these young people for a while. So last week we had for years and years now I've asked this question: What sort of thing do you think is the most important that we should be working on? in this world and for years for the last five years or so for sure they, they, they always say something about the environment doing something about the environment you know the climate change is very distressing and, and that they're going to do something about it one way or another but this year i was really surprised and Therese is here and that she can correct me i hope you won't if I <laughs> if I'm wrong, but in any case, that we we asked that question, <laughs> and to my surprise, we did not get climate change answered, but we got some almost all of them. Like the world is so divided, how can we get bring bring people together and, and do to agree? <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the air that, <laughs> that we breathe. Well, my, reflection, my reflection is that we should be aware of how the, the divisions in our country and our world are affecting the young people. And that we, they offer big challenges, which I think Rotary is in a position to work on. <clears throat> and so I, I think that we have we have our work cut out for us because Rotary does want peace. We want peace, and, and 
understanding among people in the world. We've got a job to do. So thank you very much. Charlotte, thank you. And uh, for those of you on Zoom, um, thanks to Owen Johnson for seconding Charlotte's remarks about the importance of our scholarship committee. And next week, we get to meet our new newest scholarship recipients. We have several guests here today. It's wonderful to see you all. I want to welcome Vicki King, who is going to be at the keyboard in a bit. Andy Long, who is a, a guest of Rex Hillary. Yolanda Trevino's guest is Rashad Nelms from IU. Jonah Chrismore from the Busker Chumley Theater is a guest of Sarah Laughlin. And Nicholas Robbins is a guest of Teresa Clear. Joy, have we got any guests on Zoom today? Hi, Sally and everyone. Yes, we do. We are very pleased to have with us Stephanie von Hirschberg. You may all recall that Stephanie was our guest speaker at the end of November, speaking on climate and climate change and, and the environment. So Stephanie, we're very glad you're joining us today. Thank you. Thank you all for visiting. Um, it's, it's terrific to see you all both virtually and in person. And please come back and visit us anytime. I want to thank our production team this week, Alam Barker and Michael Shermas, our Zoom host, Joy Harder. Our roundabout reporter for this month is Aaron Brewington. It's your last week, Aaron. Aaron. And thank you, of course, to Charlotte for the reflection. We've got birthdays this week. John Vanderzee's birthday is April 28th, Ruth Boschkoff, April 29th, and Bette Savage, May the 2nd. We also have a couple of member anniversaries and they are significant ones. First, Glenda Murray, past president, has been a member of this club since 1991. That's 31 years. And Joyce Poling has been a member for 33 years. Congrats to both of you. Rotarians in the news. I want to congratulate our new member, John Armstrong, Development Director of Constellation Stage and Screen. Constellation is the new name of the merger between Cardinal Stage, the Bloomington Playwrights Project, and Pegasus Institute. The new name and the first season were revealed at a big event at the Woolery Mill on Saturday night, and lots of Rotarians were there. John, you got a big job ahead of you. I think you can do it. <laughs> Okay, with that, I would like to invite Dave Meyer and Teresa Clare to the podium. So I get the fun job. I always enjoy this. I, I love having the fun job. So I, the fun job means I get to lead the induction of new members of Rotary. Uh, and so today we are very grateful to have Teresa Clare join us as our newest cl uh, club member. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about Teresa Clare before I read to you the uh, the information on what it means to be a Rotarian. So Teresa Clare first became interested with Rotary back in 2006 during a trip to Norway. Her traveling party stopped in Oslo and while there attended a Rotary meeting to exchange flags. This year, an invitation to volunteer with Rotary at the Hoosier Hills Food Bank reignited her interest. Since making her declaration to join Rotary, she jumped in with two feet. First responding to Amy 
Asajima's request to join the scholarship committee and then spending a full Saturday at the district conference. <clears throat> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa brings a wealth of energy to Rotary. Since moving from Connecticut last year, her involvement in Bloomington has been substantial. Between building homes with Habitat for Humanity, taking care of infants in her church nursery, and attending numerous functions with the Chamber of Commerce and the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation, she, is all, she was also a member of this year's class of Leadership Bloomington Monroe County and graduated last week from the program. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> In addition to all that, Teresa works full time with the Herlow Wealth Management Group. Her professional title says that she is Director of Financial Education and a Financial Advisor, but she does much more than write blogs and financial plans. Teresa sees her job as helping clients write their life stories with their wealth as the narrator. For example, for clients contemplating philanthropic estate planning, she might ask, if your money gave you a eulogy, what would it say? What you, would you want it to say? Teresa is most proud of her three boys, John Luke, Airman First Class, stationed at McGuire Air Force Base, Nicholas, a who has joined us today, a freshman at Ivy Tech, and Liam, a seventh grader at Tri-North. They are her greatest investments from which she receives dividends daily. <laughs> Some days more than others, I suspect, being a parent myself. All right, so I would like to proceed with the induction. Teresa, on behalf of the board and membership of the Bloomington Rotary Club, it is a great pleasure to welcome you as the newest member of our club. We look forward to the fellowship that you will share as well as your participation in many club projects that make our community, country, and world a better place. Though Rotary is not a political organization, Rotarians are vitally concerned with good citizenship and the election of strong leaders to public office. While Rotary is not a religious organization, it's built on those eternal principles that have served as a moral compass for people throughout the ages. Rotary is an organization of business and professional people pledged to uphold the highest ethical and moral standards. Rotarians believe that worldwide fellowship and peace can be achieved when people unite with the Rotary motto of service above self. Rotary activities exemplify the charity and sacrifice that one would accept, expect from people who believe they are responsible to help others. Teresa, you have been chosen uh, for membership in the Bloomington Rotary Club because your fellow members believe you to be a leader in our community and because you possess the qualities to champion the message and principles of Rotary. You are a representative of your vocation within our club and community. You now become an ambassador of Bloomington Rotary carrying the ideals of service to all within your sphere of influence. Our community will uh, know and judge Rotary by your character and service. We also look to you for inspiration as we strive to become better Rotarians. So now we will proceed with a pen. We ask that you wear your pen with pride, not only to all Rotary functions, but in your many endeavors as, you, as a symbol of your commitment to Rotary ideals and our recognition of your contribution toward a better world. Fellow Rotarians, please rise and welcome our newest Rotarian, Teresa Clare. Welcome. Oh, that was a feel good thing. Thank you. We have a really amazing program today. 
And so, I would like to invite Connie Shikalis to join me at the podium to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, President Sally. Well, Teresa, welcome. And Teresa might ask you what your money would say about you. I would like to ask you what your ears would say about you after you meet Lauren Bernofsky. And my advice, welcome Teresa, is just to go to YouTube later today and look up Lauren Bernofsky. Lucas Foss called Lauren a master composer. She has written well over a hundred works, including solo, chamber and choral music, as well as large scale works for orchestra, film, musicals, opera, and ballet. Her music has been described as, quote, a fantastic balance between the emotional and intellectual, technical and lyrical side of 21st century composition. One work won the National Flute Association's newly published music competition, and her opera, Mooch the Magnificent, won the Opera Puppets Award at Boston Metro Opera. And coincidentally, my friend and our guest today, Stephanie von Hirschberg, just last night performed a Lauren Bernofsky piece. There's much more to tell about and hear about Lauren, such as the many prestigious grants she has received. And I'll let her do that now. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much. Hey, is it possible for me to speak over here? Get the mic. Thanks. I have this thing about podiums. Hi, everyone. First of all, I wanted to extend my thanks to the Rotary Club for having me here today. It's really an honor and a pleasure. Um, I, I get to come here and talk about. Oh, okay. How is this picking up? That's so I need to be really close. Okay. I'll start again so everyone gets this. I just want to extend my thanks to. Rotary Club um, for having me here today. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to get to speak to you about my favorite topic, which is my current project. Um, I'm composing an opera that is titled The Mensch. I'll just give you a quick um, natural version of how, how I got here. Um, I started violin lessons at age seven. My parents said, okay, you're going to start violin lessons. That was sort of my inauspicious know, beginning as a musician. And um, in high school, uh, I started at an arts high school as a junior, and I was a violin major at the time, and it had never been on my radar to ever, ever make up a few notes, write down anything, or noodle at the piano. It just it never occurred to me. And it was only when I had a music theory teacher who said, okay, you know, you five students, you're gonna go into competition class. And I said, oh, what? And um, I was, I never took it seriously that I had any chance of being someone who could write music, and that's what composers do, right? Anyway, but he gave me a little assignment, and it was maybe writing four measures of music, like 10 seconds of music or something, and I wrote that, and he said, oh, that's pretty good. And he was encouraging me from that point on, and I got started getting feedback from other people, like, hey, Lauren, that's, that's really good, that thing you wrote. Not really, because I'm just a violinist. Anyway, so fast forward about, 40 years or so. Um, here I am as a professional composer, and it's it's a wonderful life. Um, if you're a crazy artist like me, and you don't care about things like oh, practicalities of well, how are you going to put food on the table? You know, I just sort of followed my passion, and things worked out. I'm very fortunate that way. Anyway, so opera, how did that happen? So I'm a violinist. I have the worst singing voice you've probably ever heard, but my favorite instrument to write for people ask me that question is actually the human voice because it's of course the most it's natural it's most natural it's the instrument that everyone carries with them you know people sing in the shower they sing about you know you don't necessarily have to sound good but i think everyone gets joy from singing and myself included um, i can't speak for the other people here but that's their problem anyway um i started out writing for voice um gosh at the end of my high school years 
And um, I didn't write so well for it at that time, but after writing piece after piece and getting feedback from the singers, what works for Elton, I think I've gotten pretty good at doing it by this point. Um, I've written two short operas around 40 minutes long um, that they were commissioned by Reimagining Opera for Kids for Rock. You might, some of you might have heard of this organization. They go into the schools and they perform opera for free to area schools and community centers. And so I wrote two short operas for them. So I sort of got my feet wet doing it that way. And um, I had always wanted to write like some big opera project. And I wasn't sure what it was going to be. But um, after many years of being a professional composer, I saw that my career was going in sort of two very specific directions. One was writing string orchestra music, because I got pretty good at that and have a reputation there and lots of publications, performances, whatever. And I was getting a lot of commissions that way. And also in the world of professional brass players, a lot of trombonists are interested in playing my music. I'm not sure why, but because um, I know nothing much about the trombone, but I've written some pieces they like. So I, I've gotten a lot of brass commissions and I saw that I was writing more and more in these two specific directions, but that's not really where my heart was. I just, I just want to write an opera. And um, I got some private funding that allowed me to turn down all the other commissions and just concentrate on this sort of passion project of mine. So um, once a few summers back in 2018, um, I was in Bavaria. Um, my husband is from Germany and um, the family house was there. And he was looking through some old books. He opened this one book um, that was a story of, it was called The Pianist and it was about a someone who had survived the Holocaust in the Warsaw Ghetto. And out of that book fell a newspaper article from the Frankfurter Abendmann Zeitung. And my husband opened it up and it was about this man that we had never heard of named Anton Schmidt. And he read this in German, translated it for me. And we both said, why have we not heard about this man? So Anton Schmidt was an electrician who lived in Vienna and during the time of World War II, he got drafted to work for the Wehrmacht. And he was not a Nazi, and he was not, he didn't have any political affiliations, just this nice guy, blue collar worker, you know, very popular in the neighborhood. And, you know, he didn't really make trouble or anything. But then, as the sort of the screws were getting tightened on the Jews in the area, he saw they were treated badly, they were being treated badly, and he started standing up for them. In fact, some of the people who work for him were in fact Jewish and he was, you know, they were his, not just his neighbors, but his friends. He started standing up for them, sometimes at risk to himself. And well, he ends up getting drafted into working for the Vermont and he gets posted in Vilnius or people in the area called Vilna in Lithuania. And um, he gets himself into a lot of trouble that way uh, because he ends up being able to save 300 Jews he had a sort of office position. And um, I don't think that he was, that was his goal when he got there, like I'm here to save Joe. I don't think that's what happened. I think he was doing his job and then he saw this happen and that happened and he was just a compassionate guy and he saw bad things happening to people and he tried to help them. And this is what most fascinates me about Schmidt, the power of compassion, empathy. This is. This is the, the most important takeaway for me from what I've learned about this man. You don't need to be a high, have high standing in society or be super wealthy or, or famous for this or that. Just be a, a regular person who's compassionate. He saved 300 lives. And when I came upon this story, it was, I didn't even have to think for an instant. This obviously is the story that I have to set. I want to share his story with the world because maybe I don't know if I'm, it's a kind of a lofty goal, but if some people hear the opera and realize, wait a minute, you know, this for one person to make such a difference just through their compassion, that is a message that I would love to get out to the world, to one person or a million people. And so that's, that is sort of the big picture plan um, behind why I'm doing this project. So to get now into talking about how, what it takes to make an opera, well, you have to start out with, of course, the idea, the story, which I have. You have to find a librettist. The libretto is the story, the actual words that are, 
that are sung. Um, and the story, of course, is the real life story of what happened with Anton Schmidt and his compatriots. And I decided um, fairly early on that the best of the rest was going to be myself <laughs> because I have had experience writing a libretto before. In fact, one of my two young audience operas that I've ever written, I had written every word of that libretto and it worked fine. You know, I got some compliments on it. I thought this is, this is actually convenient because as you're composing, if you're writing a line and oh, it could really use another note or two there, it's easy to just make up another word. So I can just sort of go back and forth between like the, the music and the words. And sometimes if I'm writing an aria, an aria is a song in an opera, and uh, and I'm not sure what the music should be, I'll start with, oh, well, what, what would be some catchy words to use? And I'll start off with the words, and then the words are sort of suggesting the rhythm, and, and that's how it happens. So I'm not always starting just hearing the notes by themselves. Anyway, okay, so we've got the composer of the that's me. Um, then I have to think about, well, who are the performing forces? A lot of the newer operas being written today are chamber operas written for as few as one singer or maybe two or three singers. And sometimes it's only a string quartet accompanying them. And that's not the forces I think that I really need to tell the story because there are so many interesting characters in the story. And of course, um, if you're going to stage part of it at the Vilna ghetto, which is of course this enclosed area where the Jews were concentrated, sometimes six families in a single apartment, lots of crowds, you, you have to have an opera chorus to do that. So I decided, okay, I'm just going to go for the gusto here and write a grand opera for, you know, the full performing forces of an opera company. That is an, a very big leap of faith because who knows if I'll ever get there and get this opera staged by a company, but um, one can always hope. And as I said earlier, I'm just a crazy artist, so we dream big and hope things work out in the end. And um, I'm happy, happy living this way to work out so far. So, um, talk about some particulars. So I know I've got my performing courses, and then I have to think about who's going to be singing what. So there are different voices. Of course, you all know we have male voices, female voices, male voices are lower, female voices are higher. But within that, of course, you've got like soprano and alto. And within soprano and alto, you might have a mezzo soprano, which is slightly lower. And different kinds of voices, a coloratura is a kind of soprano that can really get around and hit a lot of different notes quickly and is very agile and very light voice. And so that's a kind of voice. So I'm thinking about all these different characters and who has what kind of personality and who has, you know, what kind of voice would go with that. Now, there's one really interesting character named Abba Kovner, and he was a young man at the time um, of the story. He was 23 years old, Jewish, and he was in, excuse me, he was in the ghetto, and he, um, he was the original person um, from which the concept of this is not just a few bad things happening to Jews in this one area where you live, he had the concept of, wait a minute, maybe this is part of a huge organized plan that could be spread across Europe. And so he was a sort of a mover and shaker um, and resistance organizer. So the underground resistance was a group of, quite a large group of young men who, and some women, who were finding whatever ways they could fight back against the Nazis. And it was pretty tough because most things were taken away from them, even food. Um, and but he's a really interesting character, and I was thinking, oh, he's a young man, so we'll make him a tenor, a sort of a lighter, a higher voice for a man. Well, then I was reading some accounts of some of his speeches that he gave, and he was described as having a low, booming voice. I'm like, oh, scratch that idea. So I went back to my list of roles with all the names of the characters and what the voice was, and I crossed out tenor, and I wrote bass. So he's going to have a really low, rich voice. So what I have written so far of this opera, which will be three acts long, will be around two, two and a half hours, if the plan goes according to plan. And um, so far I've written act one. Act one takes place in Vienna. This is where Anton Schmidt was born, where he grows up. And um, I, I want to have darkness Yes, in a lot of darkness in this opera, it's a very dark topic, but I also want to have light uh, because I think that it's going to be more effective 
just like when you're eating, let's say, salty food, it's nice to eat something sweet after, right? It's nice to have variety, and I think uh, like salty tastes much more satisfying if you weren't just eating something salty. Well, the same thing in music. So I want some lighter things with the darker to, to balance it out, and I do want the dark, the dark of this up to really get to people's hearts and souls because I really want this message to you know, to really get to people in a very significant way. Anyway, so in Vienna, which is the first act, it's rather lighthearted. The music and the sort of banter that goes on between Schmidt and the customers who come into his electrical shop, and there are some like silly dad jokes in there and things like that, because I want everyone to know he's just, he's a real guy. He's not just, you know, a name in a history book. And so this is the act that I have written so far. I've written most of the words to it. Um, and the words that I did write were actually taken from, from letters and accounts we have. Um, for instance, when Schmidt is drafted into the Wehrmacht, he receives a postcard, and I have, uh, my, my husband actually translated that for me, and I quote his translation, and that is the last aria in Act One. I'm just going to check the time to see how much more details I should be giving before I add so these are going to get here a little bit oh i don't have oh 1220 oh we're still good okay anyway so i'm going to talk a little bit about um, an aria that i'm going to be sharing with you um the first run-in that we know of that is that has been written about between um schmidt and and the bad guys the nazis this is how it happened. He was in his shop one day and he hears shattering glass. And he looks outside, comes from outside, looks up, and just a few doors down, a little boy has thrown a brick through or a rock through a window of a Jewish owned business. And he and Schmidt immediately goes up, runs, and he's you know, he's not thinking about, hmm, what should I be doing here? No, he just see something, hear something, and he reacts. He runs over and he starts yelling at this kid, how can you do this to this kid? And he slaps the child twice. And this is a big, you know, I guess you could say a no-no uh, at this time, because here is someone who is shown, you know, obviously not on the side of the brown shirts of the, the Nazis. Well, a policeman witnesses this and he comes up and he, and he is admonishing he is admonishing Schmidt. I don't know the exact words of what happened, so I created a dialogue of what happened. And the policeman says, "How could you, you know, how can you slap this child like this?" And um, and Schmidt takes his sword. So the policeman had these these uh, long like scabbards, and he took it and he bent it. And that is something I did make up that actually happened. And there's some really amazing elements in this story that history has given me and so I don't even have to create it but it's going to look great on stage so Schmidt takes this sword and he bends it in half and the policeman um, I just make it up that he's going to stutter a little bit and says that's it you're under arrest and so it does happen that the policeman arrests him takes him down to the station and we don't know what happened uh, like what is happening there in fact he never Schmidt never really told his wife what was going on at the station but Schmidt was fortunately released after a few hours. Now, if he hadn't been a sort of popular guy in the community and he probably knew some of the guys at the police station because the police station was like two blocks away, um, you know, he's lucky to be alive because you could be killed for the kind of thing that Schmidt did. Anyway, so um, I took that, the story that I knew, I know that he got arrested for you know, slapping the kid who threw the brick through the window, and then I created a little scene of Schmidt coming back to his apartment. And so first, I, I just so we like really enjoy and appreciate that he's coming back, I have a little quick scene where the mother and their daughter, who's around 15 at the time, they're setting the table for dinner, you know, and the daughter says, mommy, when, when's dad coming back? And she says, oh, I, I, I don't know. He'll be back soon, I'm sure. And, and she says, well, should I set a place at the table? She says, well, of course you should set a, set a place at the table. And then she, she 
just takes a minute and says, I'm so sorry. And so this is something that I created. I'm trying to make my characters very human. And I'm thinking, well, how might I react? Or how have I seen other people react? You know, you're, it's like a roller coaster. You know, you've got fear, you've got love, you've got you know, apprehension, all these things going on at the same time. And um, so I'm just, I'm hoping my audience is going to sort of lose themselves in the story and, and just really believe that this, this is real. I, you know, I, I mean, it, it's a kind of real, it's a reality that I'm creating on the stage, I suppose. Anyway, so then Schmidt comes in and you're like, oh, thank goodness you're back, you know, I'm so relieved. And then Schmidt tells a little story of, well, yeah, you know, they, they picked me up and go, but it's okay, see, I, I'm here, I, I'm fine, right? You know, no problem. And then his wife freaks out, no problem. And then I, then I create um, the text of what she would have said to, to Schmidt. And that is the aria um, that you're going to hear today. And I'd like to invite up to perform from Connie Shikalis and Vicky Teams. Connie is our soprano and Vicky's gonna play piano. So um, as we're coming up, I'll just give you a little heads up of you know, what to listen out for. Um, I want my music to be intelligible. That is, um, you know, when things are sung, it's a little harder to understand it very often compared to when it's spoken. So I try to set it in a way that the rhythm of the words is reflected in the rhythm of the music. So in the words, no problem, I have her saying, no problem, no problem. That's what you always say. And notice I'm putting emphasis on always because the all of always is you know, if I were speaking that and yelling at that someone, that's where I would put the emphasis. That's what you always say. So, um, and, and I repeat it a lot too. You'll hear it, no problem. I probably don't need to tell you this, just you're about to hear it. Um, but this is one of the, my methods of sort of getting the point across so people can, can really grasp what's going on. Anyway, I, these are both wonderful performers. They premiered this aria just a few weeks ago, and I'm absolutely thrilled that they did. And also thrilled to have hear it today because it's probably even changed since you've like worked on it more since even the premiere. Anyway, with no further ado, here is no problem for my opera the mesh. Thank you, Lauren. Again, this is Vicky King. And I just brought how many musicians are out here besides a land, a Lauren? Oh good. Okay, I want you to listen for the augmented chords. She is really strong on these augmented chords, which are so cool. Hey, can you play one augmented chord? Oh. Uh, augmented, sorry. augmented chords. Listen, you musicians in here and out there, listen for Lauren's augmented chords. Vicki King, please play one. Another one? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. You see how it creates suspense? Bye. 
and see if there are any questions from the audience and or on Zoom. Do we have any questions for Lauren? Judy Schroeder. So Lauren, Vicki did an amazing job accompanying, but do you, are you, is there a full orchestra in your, in your draft? That is a great question. Thank you for that. Um, yes, I, I should have said that. So this is a what we call a piano vocal score. It's a, an arrangement just for piano, but I'm going to orchestrate this for a full size opera pit orchestra. So that like when you, you know, go to like a Verdi opera, Puccini opera, and, and that that's about that the size of orchestra. So yeah, I have to reduce it down and make something that's pianistic. And um, I didn't say it, but that was an absolutely Fantastic performance. Thank you so much to both of my performers. The article you found about Schmidt, was that a obituary and what sort of became of his story? That article came out in 2000 and he was, okay, I'll just give it away. Spoiler alert, he was executed by the Nazis in, yeah, I'm sorry for the bad news, um, in 1942. And I think there was a sort of a revival, I'm just sort of guessing, um, about Schmidt. And this was, I don't actually remember the why there was an article in 2000. I just remember that date because um, it was within a week of when my first child was born. And I thought, wow, well, you know, I'm like in the hospital. Maybe my um, uh, father-in-law is like reading this article and, and he's, you know, it's like this sort of, fateful connection, or I don't know. Anyway, there has been a documentary about him, about Schmidt, um, that came out fairly recently because my husband was in touch with, like when we were trying to find out, like how can we find out more about this guy? And my husband did some research and he found that, oh, there's this filmmaker. We contacted the filmmaker and I'll just give you, throw in a, a little extra thing here. I have met the granddaughter of Schmidt um, there was another aria that I wrote of this that was premiered in Vienna last summer, and she lives in Vienna, and she was able to come and hear the, you know, this, she never met her grandfather, but, you know, she was able to at least hear, um, you know, this music written about, about him. Oh. Okay, question on Zoom for Owen Johnson. Um, I'm curious, uh, what have you, you mentioned that it will be a full orchestra. Have you thought about how the orchestration might be emphasis on violins, uh, matching instruments with singers, et cetera? Yeah, great question. Um, very often as I'm writing the arias, um, I'm thinking about, oh, this is going to be brass here. This is going to be strings. And in fact, the aria that you heard, that's going to be largely played by strings because there are a lot of repeated notes, dig 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 That doesn't go well on like brass instruments for a long time, but you can sustain these quick repeated notes for that nervousness I'm going for. Um, you can sustain that on strings really well. But yeah, so as I'm writing, I write into what we call a short score. There might be a few lines, like I'll have a line that the strings are playing and a line that the brass are playing. Um, or sometimes I'm just thinking about the notes and I'm not thinking about an instrument. But when I, I have ideas for instruments, I will jot that in. And sometimes I'll even put it into the piano score because it might help the pianist play. You know, if it says French horn there, you know, they might play it in a certain way to sort of imitate the horn a little better. killed in 42, what happened to the people he was trying to protect? Oh, um, some of them got away. So the, I mean, he was killed fairly early on in the story of the ghetto. In fact, he, was, he only managed to be there and alive for about three, three or four months. And that was, so he, he was stationed there in August 41. 
and um, no, maybe it's July, but the ghetto was created like September 6th. And um, so there were a number of years later that before the ghetto was, oh, it's a horrible word and I'm blanking on it. I don't want to remember this word. Um, liquidated, yeah. Um, and some of them were killed. Um, some of them escaped to the forest <clears throat> and, um, and lived there. There were over a thousand people, I think, living in the forests around some of these major cities. And um, Abba Kovner got out. Um, he was, yeah, like, so some of them finally got to Israel, but uh, a number of them did perish. Um, he, one of the ways that he saved Jews, actually, he would bust them. He had a truck, a transport truck, that was part of what he needed to do for his job. And he would transport Jews to other ghettos that were less dangerous. Some of those Jews got out, you know, um, some of them were then it got more dangerous in the ghetto and they, you know, were brought to concentration camps. So a lot of different stories, but on record, it's, you know, the books say around 300 is the number of, of lives that he did save, you know, people who did successfully um, escape from this nightmare situation. Yes. Oh, if I can, can I call on people? Oh, yeah. Since, since your opera is about the same theme, I wonder if you know anything about the opera uh, Anne Frank that's going to be presented Ooh. here next year. I know Arthur Fagan very well, and um, I very much look forward to hearing about it. In fact, I, I met with him just yesterday because he was going over some of the arias with me. In fact, he sort of signed off on Act One. He said, this is in good shape. Anyway, and I said, oh, and I see that Anna Frank is going to be performed next year. And the reason I talked to him about it is he commissioned it. That came from him. So um, Shula Mitran is an Israeli composer, female composer, who has been commissioned to write this opera that is going to be premiered next year by IU Opera, Opera Ballet Theater. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. And, and I said, so, you know, where are you, what do you know? What can you tell me? And he said, well, we have workshopped the first act. And I said, is it a big opera? He said, yeah, it's big. And I said, is it, is it, hard? He says, yeah, it's pretty hard. Um, that's all I know. And I'm, I can't wait to hear it myself. I think it's going to be done in the spring next year. Okay, one more question. Stephanie von Hirschberg. Oh, sorry, I have to, oh, she's got it. That's right, I don't have to. Thank you so much for the presentation, Lauren. Uh, I'm interested in your creative process. And I'm, I'm wondering whether you decide whether you sit down every day at a certain time to write. Um, do you have a, yes, what your yeah. process is? Yeah, good question. Um, it certainly goes the best for me when I can set aside a time every day to write, but that's not how real life seems to happen for me. Um, I did get most of my, the, the progress that I've had so far. It has been when I, that's my first thing, like if I can discipline myself, not check email first, not check like Facebook because that then I get into this sort of black hole of uh oh it's three o'clock now what have I done um, and so that does work the best and thank you for that question um, but I I don't have any like um, sort of tried and true method that I do and successfully stick to um, having being in an artist artist colony would be ideal but that's not what, where I am, you know, I have, you know, dog, a couple cats, two kids, husband, you know, and we're trying to make everything work. And I'm in a great situation where I can, I don't have to have a full-time job. And so I can, you know, I'm sort of a master of my own time. So I am incredibly lucky. And that is something that so many composers alive today don't have the benefit. And I'm very grateful for that. And I remind myself of that a lot, you know, it's like, come on, you have this time. So that's time is really a gift. So do use that. Um, so it's, I've been writing about, uh, working on this about a year, and I'm about a third of the way through. And so I have to keep going because, you know, I don't want this to, to go on forever, but I have to constantly remind myself, okay, get back to work because, yeah, it's a big long-term project for sure. Thank you so much. Wow, um, Lauren, thank you so much for show, sharing that compelling story and information about your creative process. And one of the final results from Act One, Vicki and Connie, kudos, wow, okay.
enough wows. Except when we talk about next week. Um, next week, we have our annual scholarship recognition ceremony where we, we will be re rewarding, awarding four scholarships to graduating high school seniors from local high schools. Um, can't wait for that event. Um, I neglected to say, Lauren, in your honor, we will be making a contribution to Tandem Birthing Center, um, a new nonprofit in Bloomington. So with that, um, can we have the four-way test and we'll end our meeting. Of the things we think, say, say or do. do. First, is it the truth? The truth. Second. Second. Is it fair, fair to all concerned? Third. Third. Will it build will it goodwill, goodwill and better friendship and friendships? Fourth. Fourth. Will it be beneficial, will it be beneficial to all concerned? concerned? And, and fifth. fifth. Is it fun? Is it fun? <laughs> <laughs>